Well, I guess you know my, my age, and uh, that puts me well within the range of millennial. Um, but I promise not to do a millennial-style presentation because we are here today without any designation, as, as Ray so kindly informed us. Um, and we're really unified. I think we're unified for a very important cause. Uh, just last night, I was on the phone with my husband, and um, he was like, I'm on my way home. I'm, I'm just getting the, in the Waymo right now. And I was like, really? You're getting in the Waymo to go home? That's amazing. And I was like, is there a person? Is there like a safety driver? And he said, he's like, yes. So I'm going to whisper. Um, <laughs> so we are at a very interesting time uh, in history uh, where the technology is truly there. Um, and it's really up to governance, um, our profession, um, and leadership to ensure that we execute effectively. And that's why, um, you know, I'm, I'm here today. I was actually early RPX, um, um, 10 years before Dan joined. Uh, I was um, working with our two subscribers at the time, uh, and now they're over 300. So, you know, it just goes to show um, that there is so much we can do in the IP industry to reorder these rights, to rethink and redream what it means to be a patent-owning and participating entity. So who are we um, in, this, in this world? So we are, um, interestingly, um, uh, distributed across 4.2 million patent-owning organizations. And there's 235 of these patent-owning organizations in the short tail. And we did an analysis, and it turns out that the majority of patent professionals that work in strategy work for these 235. Not surprising when you, when you, you know, think about how challenging it is sometimes to do a transaction with these parties in the long tail. So there's four million organizations, patent-owning organizations in the long tail, that actually don't get any strategic IP services. They don't have much guidance in transactions, and pretty much their entire IP um, advice advisory service spectrum is around prosecution and filing new assets. Um, so fundamentally, this is why we don't have an IP marketplace today. It's why we've attempted to and failed um, across many large um, attempts, such as intellectual ventures um, and uh, IPXI. Um, Jay Walker, who created Priceline, also tried to create a marketplace. But, um, you know, some of the greatest minds have failed at this. So, so the question really is why? Why can't we trade and collaborate on IP more efficiently? So one of the key pain points, and um, we interviewed 25 uh, transactions attorneys, and, and I'd like to, to share their um, thoughts and emotions. So one of the key pain points is patent filtering. And um, Dan alluded to this earlier. Um, and, and part of it is, is just sorting through the vast numbers of technology components and categories. And this industry in particular has, has a very big challenge on its hands. So, if you look at all of the CPCs um, around anything pertaining to automotive today, so this is now the inclusion of autonomy, there's actually 3.3 billion concepts represented um, in the patent corpus pertaining to automotive. 3.3 billion inventive concepts discussed um, in turn. So uh, the average new self-driving car patent contains 885 inventive concepts. And so we define an inventive concept as like a winding, um, how that winding in a LIDAR is positioned? Is it adjacent? Is it, you know, um, separated in a very unique way? Um, and we're learning that because of this vast number um, of very, um, you know, detailed inventiveness that's going on, um, ontological search systems don't work anymore. So ontological search systems are rules-based systems. Um, we actually at Stanford called this old AI. Um, don't tell Mike Genezareth that. He's been there 42 years, and he believes ontological systems are still the future. But, um, but, but, but truly, to, to handcraft a rules-based system here is no longer sufficient. So this is one of actually the perfect applications, we believe, um, uh, at, at Stanford, my center, Codex. Um, the, uh, for machine learning and unsupervised learning AI. So here's the case study for you as to why, why this is of value, because we're going to talk about collaboration amongst the 
private industry here today, especially on the next panel, but there's actually quite a bit coming out of research institutions. And this is, um, it's very sad, the um, global transaction rate for university and research IP is less than 4%. So that means 96% of, of invested university research never really sees the light of day. Um, and so historically, we believed it's because most patents are, quote, crap, not my words, but, but not, not great, right? How many times have you heard that most patents are valueless? Well, no one's actually read every patent to determine that to be true. <laughs> um, it's just empirically shown to be true um, because of the frustration around getting to really the core and the meat of what an IP asset is. So at University of California, this is 10 campuses. It's one of the largest uh, research institutions on the planet um, and three national labs. So th they came to us um, a year and a half ago because at the president's level, they could not figure out what in their portfolio related to self-driving cars. They were having meetings with Ford, um, with Toyota, with all of these you know, very large um, automotive OEMs, um, but they could never answer this question uh, elegantly. So, um, you know, what is in a, oops, some of my slides aren't showing up properly. There's actually quite a bit more. Um, are you guys able to, oh, there it is. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, okay, so um, if you break it down at a very, very high level, what does it take to create a self-driving car? There's really about nine rough categories um, of, of true autonomy. And so we went through their entire portfolio and we found that if you unified across all 10 campuses, they actually had a really, really valuable portfolio for autonomy, but nobody knew that at any one of the campuses. And the reason I use this case study is because that's the problem the entire industry has today. We just don't really know how to put it all together to create a narrative that we can have a conversation around. And so we're not optimizing on value. And that has to change. So let's take out just LIDARs. Um, so LIDARs are... are uh, sensors, um, they spin. And um, here we see that if you just look at UC um, Regents' LiDAR portfolio, which is about 9% of the portfolio, which is quite large actually, um, there are 378 um, inventive concepts that just come from their LiDAR portfolio. Um, and if you map that to the potential um, set of licensees on the planet. And, and this really shows the cross-industry convergence we're facing. I was just um, at IAM's patent licensing last week, and cross-industry, um, we all agree, is, is what even exacerbates the already complex transactional atmosphere that we're in. Um, so there's 1,754 assignees that have something related to LiDAR technology that can be translated into a self-driving vehicle. So how in the world is UC going to have over a thousand conversations with, a, with just a segment of one of their, you know, already segmented portfolios? They can't have that many conversations. At most, they can have two or three a year today, and that is insufficient. How can we get beyond this? So now add to that. Uh, a, a let's face it, we're a bit of a neurotic industry. <laughs> we suffer from a little bit of neuroses around risk and n the, the negative um, connotations of, of, of you know, tr being forthright with your assets, right? Because if you're too forthright, you kind of walk the line of, I'm an MPE now. But if you hold back, you're just a Rembrandt in the attic. So like, where, where is that middle ground? Um, so, you know, we anonymize these quotes, but um, this is an individual that's been doing tons of transactions in the Valley. Um, uh, it, he, he, he writes a report every year. I'm sure he'd be fine with me disclosing his name, but I won't. Um, but he said, I need to conceal my intentions in the public market and not signal what I'm interested in because it reveals weakness. It reveals weakness. Now, imag imagine if this was tr uh, in the dating world. No one would ever date, ever. We would all be single and we'd be very lonely. So, <laughs> um, so, so quite, quite frankly, you know, there's, there's uh, and look at the second quote, good probability deal will fall apart, so we must maintain secrecy around what we're interested in. So we're already coming into these conversations feeling defeated most of the time, feeling like this is going to be complex. Um, so here, here's my proposal, and 
take it as, as you will. And maybe this is something we can adopt as an industry, maybe it won't. But third-party non-representative valuations, how do we get there? How do we get lawyers to not represent a buyer or a seller and come up with these um, objective representations as to the value of a portfolio? We launched something called Clear Estimator. Um, it's published on our website. But Clear Estimator is a way to do this algorithmically. It's daily. It's connected to the um, equity markets. Um, and it is a real-time snapshot of evaluation of a portfolio. Now, if you're from IBM and you see this, and actually, Dan brought up a good point. He's like, well, most of IBM's portfolio is licensed. So how can you represent that? I was like, well, IBM thinks this is a low number. Let me tell you, 9.6 billion. Um, but, but you know, truly, you know, we have to start somewhere, right? We have to start with some baseline to get people over the line um, of the fact that they're, you know, in a qualified conversation. So finding partners. Um, Carol said, I'm only doing it finding potential partners with a select pool of trusted people, right? So the willingness to engage in a patent um, transaction is founded in trust, and it's founded in perceived sophistication of your counterparty. So if you talk to, um, you know, like Kent Richardson or, or the folks um, in the Valley, like uh, Kurt Brash, the folks at AST, they're probably talking to the same 20 people every quarter. <laughs> um, and, and, and really, you know, these are the sophisticated, right? These are the trusted. Um, so how do we then access the fact that, uh, and, th and this, is, uh, this is actually a real life portfolio related to um, fleet management. So fleet management is one of the categories of autonomy um, in IP. And in fleet management, you know, how are you going to have conversations with companies that um, you've never heard of? Right? Some of these companies you truly have never heard of. I mean, they're coming out of the woodwork, um, VC portfolios from all over the planet. So uh, the double opt-in whitelist is something that we are trying to test um, in, in, in the real live open market for IP. Um, and effectively what this is, it's, it's a dating service. It's a double blind dating service. We studied Tinder to see if um, we could actually apply some of the, the tips and tricks of bringing people together in a blind environment. Um, you know. A, 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 an environment that had to foundationally be trustworthy um, and to get them talking comfortably and safely. And, and to do so across many, many, many pre-qualified and vetted counterparties. Um, so here you see Cruise, um, Google, and Baidu on here. Um, State Farm, interestingly, uh, I, I did not create this one, but State Farm, uh, State Farm, interestingly, has some assets in the space too. So um, having the ability to have fluid, ongoing conversations at different time periods, because it's not a single auction, the reality is, is IP is a very fluid um, kind of time determinant uh, situationally determined um, practice. Um, and then finally, how do you get the people involved? Because at the end of the day, our industry is only as good as the people in it. Um, and, and, you know, I, I've often said I have the best job because I get to work with the smartest people on the planet. So uh, that's all for me. Oh, and the last thing. The one thing I think RPX did beautifully was the non-exclusive um, perpetual license, fully paid up. And that gets away from royalty rates. Um, that's just something I, I, I wanted to leave you with. Thank you all so much for your time. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you.